Hello, Fee here, and welcome back to biology. Quick question for you to start off today's lesson. Why do you think we study biology? Or any science for that matter? You might be thinking, well, it's a required course. I have to take it and get a good grade. But there's so much more to it than that. Hopefully after today's lesson, you'll see why science is so important for us to study. To understand why science is so crucial for our lives, we'll start off with a little history lesson. Have you ever heard of Thomas Malthus? He was an English economist born in 1766. He had the idea that most humans were destined to always live in poverty and misery. Why was he such a pessimist? He noticed the rate at which the population was growing, and also the rate at which we were increasing our food supply, and he saw a problem. From the graph, you can see that the population was growing faster than our ability to produce food. Malthus thought this would always be the case, and therefore humans were doomed to an infinite future that always bordered upon starvation. At the time, the numbers seemed to support this bleak reality. In 1800, the life expectancy was only 35 years worldwide and had been that way for most of human history. 81% of the worldwide population lived in poverty. He thought the only way the world might avoid this fate was through natural population controls like war and famine, but those don't sound like fun either. While many scholars agreed with Malthus at the time, we wouldn't be so likely to agree with him now. Let's look at the numbers. Worldwide life expectancy is now 72 years, and the worldwide poverty rate has decreased to 10%. It would seem that Malthus' prediction didn't come true, even though it was based on true numbers at the time. What happened? Why did these numbers change so drastically against Malthus' predictions? That's what we'll find out in today's lesson. Before we jump in, here's our learning goals for the day. We'll summarize important scientific advancements, compare the human experience before and after the scientific revolution, and explain that good science often involves changing conclusions as more evidence is collected. Can you imagine what your life might have been like if you were alive during the early 1800s? When Malthus was making his prediction, most likely it would have been very different. Let's look at some of the ways science has made our lives better and easier. In the last few centuries, science has brought about discoveries and inventions which have led to much better healthcare. We have medications to cure diseases, procedures to heal injuries, and general medical care that prevents many early deaths and improves our quality of life. Speaking of disease, we now know that most diseases are caused by microorganisms. Understanding bacteria and viruses means that not only can we treat someone when they are sick, but we can often stop the spread of disease because we know how it is transmitted. Simple things like good hygiene and maintaining sanitary conditions in public places means that illness doesn't spread as easily as it once did. Of course, health isn't always just about whether or not we get sick. Research into healthier lifestyles has allowed individuals to make choices which naturally lead to longer, happier lives. We've also come a long way in our ability to feed the world. Advancements in agriculture allow us to produce food faster and more safely. We also know how to better store and prepare food so that it doesn't spoil. Many of these advancements help keep us safe and healthy, but our lives are also a lot easier than they would have been a few hundred years ago. Inventions such as electricity, motors, and generators save humans from countless hours of manual labor and transportation, such that we are more likely to have time for leisure activities and hobbies. All of these changes came from science, and specifically from applying the principles of the scientific method. 
We looked at the steps of the scientific method earlier in this unit, but today's lesson focuses on the end result of following those steps. Science allows us to systematically build a body of knowledge that is continually being added to and updated, so science will never be done. It is organized in its approach and objective in its findings. In many cases, science leads to advancements in technology which make our lives easier or better in some way. But sometimes the knowledge gained is simply for the sake of just that, knowledge. Wanting to understand our world and how we fit into it is human nature. It's not uncommon for new information to be gained through science, which renders old information invalid, even if the old information was obtained through science as well. This isn't a bad thing, it's just the nature of science. We are always striving to learn more and get closer to a better understanding of the world. Most of the new inventions that we love and depend on were the result of many, many failed attempts by both scientists and engineers, and the continuous revision of their ideas after they were shown to be inaccurate. Willingness to change course when the evidence suggests it is one of the hallmarks of good science and engineering. We've talked a little today about how your life would have been different in the 1800s, but what if we go even further back, all the way back to the Middle Ages, the 1300s in Europe? Any guess what was going on then and there? The bubonic plague, sometimes called the Black Death. This was no average illness. It killed nearly one half of Europe's population in the 1300s. To get a sense of how dark and hopeless the situation must have seemed, let's look at this letter written by Francesco Petrarca in 1348. I observe about me dying throngs of both young and old, and nowhere is there a refuge. No haven beckons in any part of the globe, nor can any hope of longed-for salvation be seen. Wherever I turn my frightened eyes, their gaze is troubled by continual funerals. Today, we know that the bubonic plague is caused by a bacteria. There are still a few thousand cases reported each year, but if you are infected with it now, you will most likely make a full recovery due to the availability of antibiotics, which are very effective at treating it. Unfortunately, in the 1300s, there was no knowledge of bacteria or how diseases were spread. Many did start to notice, however, that Jewish people were far less affected by the disease, suffering fewer cases and deaths than the rest of the population. A conspiracy theory quickly arose that the Jews must be responsible, and many even accused them of poisoning the wells. This may have been fueled by the fact that Jewish people often did not use the public well system. It is now thought that the Jews were less likely to catch the disease because their traditions involved many practices which improved hygiene, such as ritual washings. But with no understanding of this at the time, they were unfairly persecuted, with thousands being murdered in violent attacks on entire communities. This is unfortunately an all too common story throughout history. When humans do not know or understand the scientific explanation behind a natural phenomenon, they seek someone to blame. This is a far easier way, after all, to channel our fear and grief, rather than to accept something that seems mysterious. And science that is not understood will always appear to be mysterious. So, the tragedy of this story is that not only could science have saved the lives of millions who died from the disease, had the world been farther along in its understanding, but it could also have saved the innocent lives that were lost simply due to unfair blame. Remember that conspiracy theories will arise when the science is not yet understood, or when scientific evidence is rejected. You may have learned about the scientific revolution in your history classes. This was a time of great enlightenment and the beginning of science as we know it today. 
It started in the 1500s, but it wasn't until the 1900s that we could reliably cure bacterial diseases, such as the bubonic plague. And there are still some that we cannot cure even today. Science obviously doesn't happen overnight. It is the result of many, many repetitions of trial and error. Sometimes the results suggest an answer that is later proven inaccurate. All we can do is collect the best results we can and draw the best conclusions we can, given the current constraints of knowledge and technology. Then continue to collect more knowledge and update the conclusions as we go. And sometimes the best conclusion we can draw is that we simply need more information. A good example of this process can be found when studying the dietary guidelines released by the USDA. These guidelines are the results of the research of many scientists with a goal of helping individuals eat a healthy diet. But sometimes it seems like they change their mind about what's healthy. Up until 2015, the guidelines recommended limiting the consumption of eggs as they are high in cholesterol, which was thought to cause heart disease. However, Further research has indicated that cholesterol in food does not contribute to the risk of heart disease as much as we once thought. Of course, your personal nutritional requirements should be discussed with a doctor, but eggs are now considered a healthy source of protein and vitamins for most individuals. A similar reversal in the dietary guidelines was seen with the rise in popularity of margarine over butter in the 1980s. Dietary recommendations have always suggested limiting one's intake of saturated fats, which butter is notably high in. It became commonly recommended to switch to a newer butter substitute, margarine, which was much lower in saturated fats. However, it eventually became apparent that the saturated fat in butter was replaced with a different fat in margarine called trans fat, and that this trans fat was actually worse for us than saturated fat. Now, margarine is not generally accepted as being the healthy alternative that it once was seen as, and many dietary guidelines around the world have banned trans fats in some capacity. As always, science strives to continually learn more and do more. You may have heard the phrase, know better, do better. As science continues on its quest, we will continue to know better but it's often up to us to make the choice to do better with that knowledge. Fortunately, the state of most individuals in the world does not reflect the reality that Malthus predicted. On average, humans around the world enjoy a longer lifespan, lower poverty, and higher quality of life. All of this is true, even though the population of the world is much higher than during Malthus's time. So why was he wrong? Well, just like scientists, he could only base his conclusion on the knowledge and technology available at the time. And based on that, it was reasonable. He did not foresee the vast gains that science could make in the coming century. Those advancements greatly changed the landscape, rendering his conclusion invalid. Not to say that there aren't still many problems to solve. Half a million people still die of cancer every year in the US alone. There are serious threats to our planet in the form of climate change and extinction. And even though the poverty rate is lower than in Malthus' time, it is still too high to be considered a solved problem. We will need good science to solve these challenges, but perhaps even more, we will need the majority of society to acknowledge the scientific evidence when it is presented and act accordingly. Sometimes it is helpful to think of science as a horizon. If you've ever tried to reach a horizon, you know that as you should be getting closer, it just moves farther away. This happens in science. As we think we are getting closer to solving something, the horizon moves farther ahead, giving us new challenges to solve, using the new tools and knowledge we have gained. Of course, we don't have an unlimited supply of resources and may not be able to move that horizon forever. This will be the task of the next generations, including yours, to find ways to better use our knowledge, skills, and resources to meet the growing needs of our population. 
this task will most definitely involve the application of science. So it's not just a class. And maybe today, even more so than usual, remember that it's not just science. It's the way of life. Hey, hey.